holding my breath. We are live. Holding my breath. Oh, my holding my breath worked then. I held my breath. We went live. Therefore, holding your breath means you go live. Genius. I know. And it's working first time. I tell you what, this has been such an adventure. Um, anyway, welcome to this broadcast where I... Myself, Charlie Wyman, I am joined with Simon Raybold, and this is the fourth video in our presentations series. So already we started out with looking at how to pitch yourself and present yourself at networking events. Then we had a look at how to create uh, winning webinars that people actually want to stay until the end. Last week we talked about uh, sales presentations, so you can actually win sales rather than kind of lose out to the competition or, or leave as disappointed. And then today we're going to be talking all about um, pitching for drum investment roll, drum roll, and drum roll. We do a drum roll. funding. Drum roll. Yes, <laughs> because especially we're going through COVID times, a lot of people are pitching for funding and there are also a lot of companies that are growing and using a lot of the opportunities that are available. So, you know, the, there's no shortage of people wanting to invest and pitching for investment as well. So what we're going to talk about is basically how to create a pitch that works, that investors want to know more and that people want to give you their money because that's what it's all about. And I don't know about you, Simon, but I have sat through so many um, really, really bad pitches. And, you know, the, it can be so disheartening, like so disheartening. Yeah, no, it's, it's fine for me because I sit, I sit through a zillion bad pitches and I'm, I'm okay with that because I look at them and go, they have got no chance of the funding. And that means that the people that I'm working with have got more chance of funding. Hurrah! It's an absolute win. The fact that the bar is really low is a good thing. Yeah. Well, that, that's certainly one way of looking at it. <laughs> it's like the old thing, you don't always have to be brilliant, you just have to be better than, than the other guy. I mean, that's not literally true in, in, in investment rounds and that kind of stuff, because you have to have a certain quality before you're invest worthy, as they say. Um, but it's also a question, you do have to be better than, or you have to be seen to be better than the other people as well. And I've seen some ones where they have just, people might be pitching this is, have broken the first rule of investment pitching, which in really big, shiny letters, bigger than the, you've got the word otter in your background, bigger than that, right, write this in blood. Um, I'm just, you want, have you got your, um, what do you call it, your bleep handy? Because I'm going to need it, because I'm going to swear. You ready? Oh. Check the f rules. <laughs> Such, uh, literally, so my jobs, before I got into marketing, sort of, you could potentially call my first business experience in marketing, but we'll, we'll not go there. Um, I spent two, well, just over two years working in public sector, looking at grant funding applications for innovation. So I used to work for Sport England and then for the NHS. And I have been through countless, countless, countless um, applications for funding where they have not read the rules. Yeah. So in one way, it makes my life a lot easier because when somebody hasn't read the rules, you literally just toss that application aside. And it's such a shame because I think when I started out in that job, I was like, oh, wow, well, they've got such a good idea and you read the whole thing, but you know, you want to put them forward, but you can't, like, no. you can't. So no. there's, there's, there's a couple of things to pick up from that. Firstly, you're wasting everybody's time and that's just rude. Um, and you're wasting your own time, which is just pointless. But people are not idiots. If you turn up and you make a funding investment for something that you're not qualified for, say you have to have a turnover of 10K before you qualify for this investment, and your turnover is 9,899, that's not 10K. There is no such thing as, well, it's close enough, because there are rules for a really good reason and the people who are deciding whether or not to give you that investment are not stupid they know that you're chancing it and if it's a public sector thing they legally can't bend the rules for you if it's a private sector thing they're kind of going well why would i want to give money to somebody who can't follow a simple instruction because the big thing about investment pitches is that particularly in the private sector they're investing in you and your team as much as in the pitch and the idea. Um, because it's about it, it's not just about getting the money, it's about getting the relationship. And if they think that you're a chancer, if they think that you can't follow simple instructions, if they see that you can't follow rules, then why would they want to give you money? I know I'm stretching it a little bit, but basically it goes like this. If I can't read a form that says, 
you need to have a turnover of 10K before you're eligible. What are the chances I'm going to be able to read a form that says you need to have your VAT return in by the 14th of next month? It, it, would I want to invest in somebody who I don't absolutely trust? Because the investment pitch is all about trust. Trust in the idea and trust in your market, obviously, but trust in your ability to deliver that idea. Because honestly, you can have a great idea, but a rubbish team, and that's not going to go anywhere. So the presentation is about trust and rapport and relationship. And it goes both ways. You might decide you don't like the investor and want to walk away from it. Like That's that's cool. If you want to do that, it's a good idea if you really don't like them. But it is first and foremost impressions, emotion, relationship type stuff. I want to say first and foremost, obviously, I'm stretching the truth just to make a point, but you get the idea. Yes, but follow the rules, ultimate number one. So for anybody listening, make sure that you write that out, like Simon said, in blood and keep it at front of mind at all times. So you're talking about building trust and rapport and getting people getting people to like you. More often than not, when uh, well, well, whenever I've seen people pitch for investment, uh, they bring a lot of nerves with them and sometimes their personality doesn't necessarily come through when they're pitching because of of those nerves so what are your kind of top tips for um presenting yourself or your best self for investment when there's a lot of pressure on you okay there's a whole bunch of nerve techniques that you can use i mean they apply for any presentation but they're particularly one that my, my personal favorite which I'm, I'm sure you've heard me say before it's the one that i use all the time which is to be more batman um, you got be, me a Batman. Batman. I'm a big Batman fan, so yeah, that, easy, that one right? went to. But I, if you're talking to a non Batman fan, and unfortunately they do exist in the world, <laughs> what would you say? Okay, so rule number one become a Batman fan and just improve yourself. But it doesn't have to be Batman. I'm using Batman as my personal. So the idea is that if you don't know what to do, if you don't know the way forward, you create a theoretical or hypothetical of somebody who would know the way forward and you just so if i'm in a situation where i don't know what to do and i know this sounds bonkers but literally i'm kind of going right i'm lost in the airport i don't know what to do i don't know where i'm going i don't know where the car pickup thing is i don't know what the currency work you know i don't know what to do who do i you know who 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 would know what to do oh yes batman would know what to do what would batman do batman would (laughs) <laughs> and then because it's much easier to look at things from the outside so i don't know what to do but i you know if i was giving advice to somebody else or all that kind of jazz so it doesn't have to be literally batman but it has to be the best self so you kind of go on i i feel really nervous about this this pitch but who do i know who would be able to make a brilliant pitch so and so would make a brilliant pitch what would they do and i think it's really important that you pick when you pick so and so it is not a real person because, as I say, this is about relationship and trust. So you don't want to go out there and fake being somebody else. So there's no point in me going, I don't know what to do. Who would know what to do? Charlie would know what to do. Right. I'll pretend to be Charlie. I'll do what Charlie would do because that's disingenuous. And that's that long term relationship is not going to last because I can't be like Charlie all the time. You're far, far, far nicer than than I am. Um, <laughs> far less, far it- less grumpy. <laughs> But you can create yourself a theoretical best version of you. Now, Batman, perhaps not the best example in the world because he's a bit dark and a bit vicious sometimes. What would Batman do? Hit somebody? It's probably not where you're going. He's um, also not known for following the rules either, so probably not. Well, no, this is probably not. Yeah. What would Batman do? Ask Alfred. It's also not a, not a good response. But it wants to be somebody who, or, or a hypothetical someone that could go out there and go, what's the best version of me going to do? Or the other technique I like uh, a lot is is one called peripheral vision. Um, there's a whole but and it works really well in pitch situations because when you're nervous, your brain produces a whole bunch of hormones, one of which is called cortisol. Um, cortisol does a whole bunch of really good things, like it speeds your brain function up and all of that kind of jazz and allows you to think much more quickly. But what it also does is narrow down the number of things to which you pay attention. And if you are pitching to just a couple of investors or maybe even one investor, you become obsessed with just the one investor, which means that everything to which your brain is paying attention is frightening. Well, there's no wonder you are frightened. But if you become aware of what's in your peripheral vision, 
that one frightening thing now becomes diluted. So with my tongue in my cheek, I'm looking at the screen. I'm, I'm looking at you. I've got a 29 inch monitor. So I've got a really big Charlie Wyman in front of me. If you're the, yeah, I know it's terrifying. If you're the frightening thing, everything about that front. But if I now do this and I go, okay, Charlie's face is still frightening, but out of the corner of my eye, I can also see a, a drawing that my daughter did when she was three years old on the wall. My, that's not frightening. My microphone is not frightening. My lamp is not frightening. My tea mug is not frightening. The window is not frightening. Um, my laptop over there recharging is not frightening. My printer over there, that's not, I can see all of these things out of the corner of my eye. So I, for lack of a better term, I dilute the Charlie. That sounds like everybody really needs sense. to dilute the Charlie. I suppose that could be taken completely out of context. Okay, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's be careful about that one being edited into something <laughs> else. Done. Um, but if you sort of mean, so I'm now looking at you, and if you did scare me, you don't, but if you did, I now become consciously aware of all the other things around me that don't scare me. So that you don't look at them, you just become aware of them out of the corner of your eye. So Charlie becomes, or the scary thing, the investor becomes one thing in 15 that I can see, as opposed to one thing in one mm. that I can see. Um, and that just calms people's nerves enough for the first two or three minutes to get into the flow of things. That, oh, that's really interesting. Cause, um, a couple of years ago, I went to the Web Summit event. And for anybody watching this who has ever been to Web Summit or wants to go to Web Summit, go because it is absolutely brilliant. It's crazy. There's like 70,000 people that go. It's in Lisbon. It's this huge sort of tech event. There's loads of things that are going on. But it's such a huge opportunity for a lot of um, startups to go and practice pitching, but then also get in front of mentors and peers and investors as well and just start start talking about growing your business and the things that you need to do. Um, and there are a thousand startups that go to this three-day event that have their opportunity. I know it's crazy. And it, it's it's weird because you have like a third of them on the first day that have a little ex exhibition stand and then on the second day and then on the second day. So if you miss seeing one person on the first day, then you're not going to see them the other two days because they'll be off doing other things. And mm. in each of the uh, zones, they had these investment um, stages. And the way that they designed the stands was that when the um when the startup came to pitch their invest pitch for investment they stood up on stage they had a lectern they didn't have to use it and then they had slides in the background but they pitched to the crowd and like anybody i mean this was like an open event it wasn't a closed door event so you had people that were walking all around you had people sat in front of you but the investors there were always three investors that sat on the stage sort of by the side of you. So like you were talking to the crowd, you weren't actually pitching to the investors, they were at the side mm -hmm. of you. And I'm wondering whether or not, based on what you're saying, that they designed it that way to yeah. Yeah, reduce the pressure. I don't know for sure. I'm not in the minds of the designers, but that would be something that you could, because because the, the crowd are a no risk opportunity at this point. You can design, you can play to the crowd, you can do what you want to the crowd. Mm. And actually their response barely, barely matters. It's, it's the funders, the people there that are sitting with big piles of £20 notes or whatever it is. They're the people that you need to impress. And they didn't um, so actually do that. Either. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it wasn't very Dragon's Den with the pitching. But I mean, the uh, again, the opportunities as well. Like when you're applying to be a startup that goes to this event, I think it was 50 people that got selected of the, the thousand startups that exhibited. 50 people got selected to have the opportunity to pitch. But it wasn't just the opportunity to pitch to some investors. It was the opportunity to stand up on stage and actually practice getting your um, getting your message out and approaching more and more people. And it was such a phenomenal opportunity. And it was great to sit in the crowd and, and listen to all of the pitches going on because I was there with a with a startup that was pitching for investment and also see the responses. So the person pitching couldn't always see the responses of the investors. So they didn't necessarily see when they were drifting off to sleep or like going, you know, getting really frustrated because there were so many really good concepts being presented, but the, the pitch deck didn't contain the information that was interesting to the investors. Yeah, yeah, it was so interesting th to the yeah. company because they've developed this idea. So I think it was back onto what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, which is, you know, it doesn't matter what the technology does. It doesn't matter what's in the box. It's what yep. the box does. Mm -hmm. And it was unbelievable yep. how many companies actually missed that point because they were so excited about what was in the yes. box and what was the, what yes. the technology did. But that 
and, and, and that's perfectly understandable because they they are not there for investment. They're there because they are passionate about the thing, the, the stuff that's in the box. But you picked, you, you gave a couple of really important words there. The one that I want to just jump up and down and cheer about is, is practice. Ah, yes. <laughs> kind of fine in Melbourne, so it's not like it's just practice. You can't, you know, this kind of thing. Investment opportunities don't come around often enough for you to be able to wing it and blow it. Mm -hmm you have to be able to practice. And the people I recommend you practice to, just as you've we've mentioned before, are people who know absolutely nothing about your gig. Because that way, you know, if I've invented a new search engine and I start telling you how it is, how it, how it works, nobody cares. What they will ask me is, yeah, but doesn't Google already do this? Um, and pitching it to practicing to people who have absolutely no idea about the how of things starts to become really powerful because they can start going, yeah, but I don't care about the how. I really don't care that it uses this algorithm and that algorithm. I just care that it's faster than Google, more accurate than Google. Uh, why would I want to invest in it? And how, so like from an investor, price. like how is this going to make me money? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Which is the thing that the things that people always forget to put in there. I've got a note down here. I was preparing for today. It's almost like, almost like I prepare. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you, you you have to know is your your numbers. You can't just go in there and go, oh, it's about two k. You have to go in. It's two thousand four hundred and thirty two, plus or minus X percent. Origin of data. This now, no one cares. But what that does is that it proves that you have done your research, you know your stuff, and even if the or you know, the, the margin of error five percent, two percent, even if you, that's irrelevant, what it does is it proves that you have thought things through. So you don't necessarily go in there with a this will work so and so. You go this will work so and so. If it goes better, then this. If it works less, then that. My margin of error, my estimate range is is so-and-so here is my predicted uh return but i have also modeled four other rates of return and i've gone for the most the second most conservative of four options but that just proves to the investor that you're trustworthy you get the detail and and all of that kind of stuff so and, sorry. i know i know you're you're the master of research with all things like this so what i'm, I'm really keen to know because I have very strong opinions on this, but then they're my opinions. <laughs> so what does the research tell you in terms of how you present uh, data, so statistics, forecasts, and things like that in a presentation when pitching for funding or investment? On paper, the research is very clear that you want to give the headline stuff on the slides behind you, but not the details. The details wants to be in the, the stuff that, so the, the big headline stuff is, is supposed to be designed to get people to want to read the hard copy. And the detail goes in the hard copy. So what you don't do on the slides is gone, I've modeled four options. This is the second most pessimistic of the four, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And here's option one, mm -hmm. here's model two, here's model three, here's model, because that's like mind numbingly boring and you're up against the clock. You go, I've modeled four options. This is the second most pessimistic. The other three are in the handout pack that I'm going to give you later on so that you can see that I have done due diligence. So that you, the idea is to get people excited and interested and to prove that you are trustworthy. But the, the, the other thing that always strikes me about the research, which people don't always take on board, is when you tell them what the hell it is it does. Because there's, there's two schools of argument. Do you tell them what you want at the very beginning? Hello, my name's Simon Raybould. I want X thousand pounds for Y percent of my company, a la Dragon's Den. Or do you put that at the end when you have, in theory, created intrigue and gone, okay, so if you want to buy into this, I can offer you X percent of the company for an investment of Y thousand pounds, whatever it is. The research is, is clear about other types of in the presentation. As far as I'm aware, I don't know of any research into this in particular, but for other types of presentations, give them the big ask at the beginning. Give them the bloody big idea up front so that they can compare what you are telling them with a baseline. And the other thing that should go up the front is not just how much DOS you're offering, it's what the hell it 
is. And that's a real problem to, invest, to, to people who are looking for investment because you know what it is because you've lived, breathed and drank this thing for 18 months while you physically built 32,000 prototypes, only one of which has been half working. But the investor has no idea at all, absolutely no idea at all. So the, the, there are lots of tools for doing this, but the idea that the tool that I really recommend to people most of the time is, um, is like but. It's like, like but. but. Yeah, it is like X, but different because. And that means that the the audience, the investor gets what it does straight away, assuming they know what X is. Um, so I don't know how long would it, how if you're teaching LinkedIn, because I've, I've done one of your LinkedIn courses, there's about four hours worth of, of material there, even if I don't listen to all of your videos, or would I ever fast forward any of your videos? <laughs> um, but there's, there's a shed load of material there. And even then you don't cover everything there is to know about LinkedIn. But what somebody who's designing LinkedIn and saying, please give me investment for LinkedIn, what they might do is include all of your material and then go yada, 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 I want some money. How about this for a, um, an it is like but for LinkedIn? It is like Facebook, but for grown ups, or it is like Facebook, but for business. So even if the person to whom you are pitching has no idea of how the hell it's going to work, they've got the big idea behind them. I, I did that on stage once and I, I played a game of going, let's let's do is like but and Facebook and sorry LinkedIn is like and I was expecting them to say Facebook but for grown-ups and somebody in the front row I, I kind of LinkedIn is like and this person shouted out Tinder but for jobs and there's this <laughs> horrible horrible silence in the entire audience while everybody looked at this woman and went did you really mean to give that away or We've got Elaine joining us live. Hello, Elaine. I just commented like, no, which, yeah, I think I'm like sort of shuddering. It's like there's no swipe left and swipe right feature. But it's it, I think as well, like you do raise an interesting point, which is that when you're doing that, it's like a uh, but to choose something that people actually know. So when you say it's like, make sure that the other person that you're talking to understands what that it's like thing. So they've got that baseline. Yeah. Absolutely. And the other important thing there to do is when you compare features, it, it is like so and so, but the but thing that you do is relevant to the money that you want. So, for example, a pen is like a pencil, but what? It's like a pencil, but uses ink. Who cares? The key thing about a pen is a pen is like a pencil, but permanent. That's the magic thing about it. So if no one has invented a pen, let's pretend we have a world where pencils exist and pens don't. I could go on stage, I've invented a pen. What's a pen? A pen is like a pencil, but you can't rub it out. <gasps> and now everybody knows what the hell this thing does. And you've captured their curiosity as well. So they're like, right, okay, I'm, I'm interested. Tell me more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you've got that, the presentation then becomes a question of not losing it <laughs> rather than trying to gain it. And oh, right. So, it's a lot easier. So that that is an interesting point. And Elaine's just commented saying it does what it says on the tin. Exactly. I think there was, a, there was an old boss that I used to work for that um, she didn't understand the technology at all. So she was just like, right, it's the Ron Seal effect. I want you to tell me what it does so that I can understand it. And if I can understand it, then everybody else will be able to understand it. And it was quite, it was a really good, especially cause it, like me, when I first joined that company, I didn't, didn't really know much about marketing. I was like, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. <laughs> um, so so that was that was really good. Um, but you, you do raise a very good point, which is all around like keeping people engaged and not losing them. So you've, you've grabbed their curiosity, you've grabbed their attention from the start. How do you keep them engaged right until the end? <laughs> Actually, that's less of a problem in a, um, a pitch presentation than in many others for two reasons. The first is they tend to be short. Mm. All right, so it's, it's, it's not as big a, big a deal. And the second is that the people to whom you are presenting that matter, let's forget the audience for now, we're talking about the investors, they are professional presentation watchers. Their job is to, is to pay attention. So it's not as difficult as, as it might sound. 
And if you have got their attention at the beginning, all you have to do is not lose it. You don't have to, you don't have to build it up. The things that, that help uh, are the same for any sign, any presentation in general, for the love of God, signpost. Um, just really, really, okay. So we've talked about what it does. I want to move on to talk about how big the audience is for it. And what that does, I, I want to cast your mind back, try to cast your mind back to when you were at school or university. I will put money on the fact that you paid attention for the first five minutes of a lecture. You fell asleep in the middle of the lecture. <laughs> And you woke up for the last five minutes of lecture. I'm, my tongue is in my cheek a little bit, but as a general pattern, you don't pay attention to the middle. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I definitely didn't fall asleep in any of the lectures. Um, but yeah, I definitely zoned out and yeah. looked at other things so, that were more and, interesting. And the reason that you started to pay attention at the end is because the lecture would say something like, so in conclusion, and you're, oh, all right, okay. What, that, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is that people pay attention when they think the end is about to arrive and they pay attention when the beginning has just happened. So instead of making a 10 minute pitch, consider making four or five two minute pitches. Two minutes. What does it do? Finish that presentation, wrap it up and go, OK, so that's what it does. Black slide. Starting a new chapter, here is how many people might want to buy it. And that's, you, you stop the presentation, you start a new one, and anybody who has fallen asleep starts to have an opportunity to join back in again. But the graphs of attention paying are quite easy. Instead, instead of going down, along, and up, they go down, and up, down, and up, down, and up, down, and up, because you're always starting a brand new presentation. And that the rules for that are big ass black slide or whatever. Um, move to a different part of the stage, have a different presenter. If you're slick about it, for God's sake, be a slick. We'll talk about the Oppenheimer effect in a moment. If you're slick about it and you can pass the baton, something that it really restarts people's attentions. So f when I say a different presenter, by the way, I mean a presenter with a different style because there's no point in swapping out one white middle-aged bloke for another white middle-aged bloke. If you're going to swap me out, swap in somebody who is very clearly different to me. So the audience go, oh, right, OK, so a new start. Um, so it, it may be that in a, pitch, in a pitch deck, you and I might tag team because you're clearly neither middle aged nor a bloke. I, I, I like to camera. believe that that's a clear difference. <laughs> difference there. I did have somebody on the phone once that referred to me as Mr. Wyman, having already spoken to me before, which um, did rub me up the wrong way a little bit. But anyway. <laughs> it's not as bad as some stuff I've had mispronunciations of my name. Um, I've been doing some work um, online to Spain um, and recently, and they pronounced the, the letter I as though we pronounced E-E. -E. So if you take the word Simon... And pronounce the letter I uh, as E. It gets pretty embarrassing, really. Um, so well, I, some way to I, lighten I the no mood. <laughs> I have no sympathy with somebody calling you Mister. Honestly, I have none at all. Um, but the other thing that strikes me is that so we've not talked about Batner's either. I mentioned knowing your numbers earlier on. Batner, most people will know if you've done any negotiations training and all of that kind of jazz. Um, Batner stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In layman's terms, it's the point at which you go, stuff this, it's not worth it, walk away. And you want to know that before you walk in the in front of the investors, because if if you give them an in, if you give them this and they ask for this, and you're going, oh, well, I, I don't know, um, does that mean that it's no longer worth my while? I'd be, uh, you can't do that negotiation in your head or with them in the heat of the moment. You need to know what your threshold is. If they say, I will give you £72,000 for 85% of your company, and you've done the maths and the spreadsheets, and you've, you know that you can only afford to give away 83% of your company, you say no. You don't go, oh, it's only 2% over my You just say, no. I'm, I'm pretending here you have the option to walk away, but you get the, you get the gist. And every single time I have seen somebody lose it because of the, almost every single time I've seen somebody lose it because of the Oppenheimer effect, it has been because they haven't known their numbers and they haven't known their tech or the, and they haven't known their Batner. 
That's always one of the biggest frustrating. frustrations watching things like Dragon's Den. I mean, I haven't watched it for a few years, but um, years ago I used to watch it all the time. And every single time they challenged the numbers or every single time that they offered something that wasn't what was originally asked for, the mm-hmm. people that got all flummoxed and started trying to yeah crunch the numbers in their head never walked yeah. away with the funding <clears throat> and also hit, like the credibility and confidence level went down as well because they sort of you could see them actively crumble um mm. it's just because they didn't know and i don't think i don't think our brains are capable of kind of computing that whilst under stress <laughs> they're not absolutely right. i wouldn't try and do it um i sure as hell wouldn't try i've done all the spreadsheets beforehand and I would go, okay, I know I can trade off this for that, but I can't give away, I can't give away, I can't give away both. Um, but I've, I've mentioned a couple of times, I need to get this in very quickly before we're out of time, but I've mentioned a couple of times the Oppenheimer effect. Yep. Um, this is the idea where if you're good or bad at one thing, people subconsciously assume you're bad or good at the other. Okay, so if you walk on stage and you don't know your numbers, and you can't work your technology, and you fall over your shoelaces, there is a subconscious association in the audience's mind, in the punter's mind, in the investor's mind, that you don't know what the hell it is that you're doing. Right? If I can't operate a Mac laptop, what are the chances of me being able to operate a production line to make left-handed widgets? So is that making sense? On the other oh, hand- Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If I, if I turn on and I just go click and it's slick and I know my numbers and I'm dressed well and my slides look good and all that kind of just, it gives the impression that I'm going to be competent at the other things as well. It might not be true, but it gives the impression that, um, that I'm going to be competent, which is why I say if you can do a two-hander with somebody who's not you, those handovers need to be slick as well. What you don't want to do is go, oh, so that's it uh, for me. Um, uh, Claire, have you got anything? Is it's you now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to talk about so and so. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I finish. I finish a full stop, and Claire just magically starts to talk because we have rehearsed it and we can slickly pass the baton. And that it all comes down to practice, exactly what you were saying before. Um, and also practice of the numbers. So don't just practice your pitch. Practice uh, with an audience that does challenge your numbers and offers something slightly different and tries to throw you out. Because it is, you know, it's, it's important that you're you're going to do yeah. it. It's all about credibility and practice and getting. It, it, to be honest, this one is about prep more than anything else. Actually, the other one I did want to add as well, which was is around is around feedback and especially. Um, at the web summit because I had the opportunity to go and talk to quite a lot of the investors about what you know I, I was doing it on behalf of my client at the time so I'm like right what do you actually look for and what, what are the reasons why you may disengage or you know why, why do you walk away and they were saying that one of the things that's most frustrating is when you come across a company that you give feedback to they've got a really good idea really good concept but their pitch needs a lot of work you give them feedback around how to improve it and then they don't do anything and it, you know exactly what they should do at that point, right? Phone me. <laughs> phone me. Phone me. Because that's what I do. Yeah. That's where most of my work comes from. There you go. Phone Simon if you want some help with that. And also, I mean, I'll, uh, I could testify how awesome Simon is because I was having a mini meltdown. I recently entered a competition. No, <laughs> and, uh, at all. And Simon was just like, yeah, you've you got to practice it. And I. On, oh, yeah. Calm. I, I finished writing the script at 4 p.m. on Tuesday and then did the presentation at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Anyway, um, I've got lots of time to practice for the final. Well, good. Don't tell them that. Don't tell them that. People don't want to know that. Um, <laughs> this, you mentioned about something there which just triggered something. I want to go back and finish off where we started, which is about the rules and the mm-hmm. feedback and stuff. Because one of the things that you'll get feedback on is how well you hit the judging criteria. Mm-hmm. Because the people who are investing don't just go on hunch. You know, they've got to have, you, you, for the five or six or seven criteria you've got, they've got, they need you to score a maximum of overall of whatever it is, and you need to have at least three out of five or whatever it is for all of the criteria. Find out what those criteria are beforehand. Design your presentation to hit those criteria. Don't get all bloody Cadbury's gorilla playing the drums in your presentation. It looks awesome and that is, is fabulous, 
But unless it's a Cad, you know, unless you're, you know that it's a Cadbury's advert, it doesn't do anything. And anybody under the age of thirty is now going, "What the hell is he talking about? What gorilla advert?" Um, just trust me. Go and look for the Cadbury's drumming gorilla on YouTube. It's the coolest thing you'll see in a long time, with the exception of Bad Piper playing ACDC. Trust me. That's I've not your seen that one. one. I've I've definitely seen the Cadbury's gorilla, but I've not seen the other one. So I'm definitely going to go and check that out. But yeah, the rule but, the rules are really important and the criteria because you could score full points in one of the sections, but if you don't score anything in another section, absolutely, yeah, you know, you're, you're going to lose out. Yeah. So section one. What's my market? Section two, what does it do? Section three, where's my other funding from? Section four, who's my team? Find out what the damn criteria are and make sure that you hit something along each of those check marks. And also seek feedback as well. So if you've, if you've done it and you've not won investment, don't get dissuaded because you know everybody else is in the same boat. And um, go and seek feedback. Ask for how you could improve it. Work on it. Keep practicing it. And yeah, just don't, don't be dissuaded from people saying no. Uh, because no doesn't always mean no, definitely never. It could just mean no, not right now. Quite often it means no, because there were, I only brought 100,000 pounds to the metaphorical table and other people were better than you. In six months time, when I bring another 100,000 pounds to the table, you might be the best of a bad bunch and therefore you will get the money rather than not. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to hear more about companies that have uh, one investment having done this whole process pitched, been turned away, refined, got feedback, pitched again. Uh, there's a few podcast interviews that I just want to point you towards. Um, the, on the Curiosity Key podcast, which if you're looking at my YouTube channel, they're all on YouTube. All of the interviews are recorded and available here. They're also on my website. Just go to charliewyman.com forward slash podcast. Um, but the, there are three specifically I want you to, to go and have a look at. The first one is with um, an incredible woman called Jana Dowling. And um, she talks a lot about being you know pitching for investment being turned down keep going getting the feedback and she kept doing that with that relentless attitude and keep refining and pitching and practicing and she got the investment in the end so that's really one that I recommend listening to the other is with a guy called Javed Katak that he talks about the difference between sort of pitching for investment for like large corporates versus doing it when it's all self-funded and it's you on your own so that's a really interesting one and then the other one is with a guy called Russell Stolters and he talks a lot about um, looking at copy so that one would actually tie in really really well with everything that Simon yeah, yeah. said um, around understanding, you know, what are the problems that you're trying to solve and how do you word it in a way that people don't zone out? And most importantly, if you are pitching for investment and you are nervous and you're wondering what to do, then ring Friendly. Simon. <laughs> You know, ring Simon, talk to him because, you know, he, he can help you. And it's that, you know, that small investment in getting that help from somebody else can mean the difference between winning investment and not. So I hope... Shall, shall we stop before it turns into an advert? Oh, it's not an advert, but it's just like, you know, sort it out. <laughs> Don't suffer in silence. We need to stop anyway because we're over our, our we, half hour. We are. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, hello, Elaine, and welcome. Thank you for, for commenting and, and keeping us going. This will be recorded. So if you are catching the replay, um, just put a comment and say, caught the replay. Let us know what you think. And um, yeah, see you next time. Oh, take care, everybody. Bye.